switched on or within the room about what's going on, we encourage you to do that via Twitter and not to put those comments in, in the um, line. You will see that we're being recorded now and so everybody should be aware of that. Okay, thank you. I think that's the uh, business uh, side of things. So it's my great pleasure this, this uh, I keep wanting to say afternoon, but this morning for our speaker to welcome Dr. Walter Parker. Uh, Walter is Professor of Social Studies Education and Political Science at the University of Washington in Seattle. Um, he's uh, a member of the National Academy of Education, and he's a specialist, as you will quickly see, um, in curriculum and also in youth civic development. He's a very uh, widely published scholar, um, and many of you may be familiar with his book, uh, Teaching Democracy, Unity and Diversity in, in Public Life. Um, I won't uh, go through uh, lots of details about Walter's CV now, but it's um, available to read at the University of Washington uh, uh, platform. And I met Walter about 18 years ago on the project Democracy and Diversity, Principles and Concepts, for Educating for Citizenship in a Global Age. So we're very, very honored to have you with us today, Walter. Um, uh, particularly because you are one of the first people we've published in Human Rights Education Review and Walter's um, uh, paper published in 2018, Human Rights Education Curriculum Problem, uh, has been actually our best read paper uh, in, in the history of the journal. Um, I'm not going to talk about that any further because uh, Walter himself is going to be addressing some of the questions in that paper, which was entitled Human Rights Education's Curriculum Problem, rather provocatively titled, I think. So we look forward uh, to hearing you speak, Walter. Walter's going to speak for about 35 minutes. And as I said, you can post questions to him in the chat line and we will uh, be taking those questions uh, when he's finished speaking. Over to you, Walter, we're delighted to have you with us. Thanks so much, Audrey. Can you hear me all right? Yep. I'm thrilled that you all could uh, join in today, this morning, as I would say, I'm still having morning coffee. Uh, I'm grateful to be hosted by Audrey Osler and what, a, what an accomplishment Audrey, that you have created this open access international journal and now we're seeing it already in its fourth volume, its fourth year. So thank you, Audrey, for that creative effort. I'm joining you this morning from Seattle, Washington, from my home, still in lockdown, more or less, like many of you, I presume. Um, Seattle, you know, is on the northwest coast of the United States uh, on a large body of Pacific seawater called Puget Sound, uh, which carries cargo ships from the Pacific around the peninsula and into the ports of Seattle and Tacoma and north to Vancouver, Canada. Let me acknowledge that uh, my home and that Seattle are on the homelands and fishing waters of the Coast Salish peoples, such as the Duwamish and the Suquamish, of whom uh, a man named Chief Seattle, that's where Seattle gets its name, was the leader some decades ago. Uh, I am, as you can see, a white uh, male. I'm a straight white male, a college professor, just recently retired. So I guess I'm officially now an old white man. And that's a famous demographic, of course, here in the United States. It's that demographic that's mainly responsible for uh, Donald Trump's support. So it's a somewhat dangerous demographic. Uh, I'm trying to be aware of the privileges that uh, that standpoint gives me such as driving or walking alone, uh, but I'm sure I've only barely scratched the surface of that 
privileged knapsack that I wear on my back. I'm discussing today an article that I wrote, as Audrey said, uh, in the first issue of her journal, Human Rights Education Review, uh, called Human Rights Education Problem. The, uh, my slides look kind of like this, uh, only they have paragraphs on them. So let me get this advancing. Uh, and I know that's not very fancy and uh, there are no interesting uh, visuals, but uh, it helps calm my nerves to have the text in front of me and that way it keeps me on track and I'll be able to uh, finish on time. Uh, so let me, uh, let's get started. Uh, in case there's a, in case our, we, we lose power, I, I can at least give you my point right off the bat here. My thesis in this article is that while human rights education has expanded dramatically over the last few decades, its curriculum remains underdeveloped. So I realize that I, I'm a newcomer to this literature and this problem space of human rights education. I have danced around the edges of it for many decades, but I've only begun reading deeply in this literature over the past five years or so. And I'm let me acknowledge that I'm aware that in the room today, there are many senior leaders of this field so I'm come at it with some humility, but it, the, the thesis does appear true from where I stand that the curriculum remains underdeveloped. And I hope to show you how I've come to that conclusion. Uh, the World Program for Human Rights Education, for example, calls for a curriculum of knowledge, skills, values, and action, but does not actually develop one. Uh, and the popular about, through, and for framework for HRE is a helpful start, starting point, but of course, it's only a starting point. Curricula have to be developed locally, of course, where they have to make sense and get enacted. But still, the result is that the HRE curriculum remains scattered, ill-defined, and really too variable to be robust. And uh, the, there's a tremendous amount of advocacy, of course, which is absolutely needed and valuable, but it's no substitute for curriculum development. They are, they are quite different things. So I don't want to in any way dismiss all the work that has been done by members of the audience to develop curricula. Uh, just Hugh Starkey alone, for example, has done so much curriculum development work in human rights education that it makes my head spin. Uh, but the, there's a, we need more, and particularly a kind of networking and cooperation that builds up the theory and practice of, of human rights education. So, the problem that I'm seeing, it becomes apparent when human rights education is compared to curriculum that are coherent and well-established in schools. Curricula for algebra and biology, for example, or, or national history in our various countries, as contested as those histories often are, there's what I'm pointing to is to notice that they are entrenched in the schools. They are established in the schools. They have a large footprint in the schools or at university law, medicine and social work as different as they are, they're well-established, they're entrenched, they're interdisciplinary fields. Uh, so my standard for a robust curriculum is rather high then. What I do is look at what, what curricula get well-established in schools, what curricula have large footprints in schools and I compare human rights education to them and find that it's underdeveloped. That might strike some readers as unfair, rather like comparing infants to adults, but I think it points to factors that can help human rights education succeed in schools. And that indeed is my objective. Uh, curriculum development is what HRE requires now, I think, if it's to move forward. 
there will still be many obstacles. I don't deny them, uh, like local politics and uh, funding, intimidation by government officials, etc. There's, of course, conservative opposition from particularly now the ethno-nationalistic right. Uh, but there's also on the left progressives inattention to curriculum, which I say quite a bit about in the article. Uh, progressives have turned to other matters and sort of left curriculum to others, uh, which denies the field the expertise that it could really use. Still, particular forms of curriculum development are needed, and that's what I uh, endeavor to describe in, in this article. The, uh, let me say that I am also interested in human rights education in informal settings, very interested in the articles I've read in the journal, for example, about uh, curriculum development, well, the curriculum in, in refugee centers, for example, human rights education in, in refugee centers and in humanitarian settings of that sort, or the curriculum development that's been done by NGOs. I'm, I'm interested in HRE and in informal settings, but I concentrate on HRE and formal settings such as schools and especially K-12 education. Uh, they, let me say just something about progressives in attention uh, to curriculum development. The, uh, I regard myself as a progressive educator or an educator of the center left in the tradition, in the American tradition, at least of John Dewey in particular. Uh, but the progressives have over the past 40 or so years turned to other matters. In particular, I discuss three in the article, um, which are curriculum criticism. Uh, they've also turned their attention to the learners themselves, the sociocultural situations of learners. But neither, both of those are terribly important. It's just that neither of them are curriculum development. So we have to learn to keep a number of balls in the air as good jugglers. Uh, it's not, if you're keeping one ball in the air, that's not juggling. So I offer a strategy with two steps, uh, the identification, organization, and publication of core human rights education, knowledge, and skills. It's odd to see the word publication there, I realize. Uh, but the, what publication is all about is making public. So our work must be on public display, otherwise it's not available for public criticism. And if our work is not available for public criticism, then it cannot develop. This is nothing new, this is normal science. That is, that is science in a nutshell. Make the work public, expose it to criticism, and in that way, the work grows. If, if we just have a number of siloed uh, operations that are not communicating and networking and criticizing one another's work, then the field by definition cannot grow. So the, the first step is the is curriculum development, the identification organization. That's a huge part of curriculum development and publication of core knowledge and skills. And I'll talk a little more about what I mean by core. Uh, basically just central, the, the core structure of the curriculum. And then of course, the articulation of these knowledge and skills with students' everyday knowledge and identities. But if, with that, we sort of lose, we leave the curriculum platform and move to the instructional platform. And that's an old fashioned distinction that I think is still quite useful. Curriculum is the what, uh, instruction is more or less the how, as well as the way we relate to students. So I think that those two will go a long way toward organizing a curriculum and helping students learn it. The first one without the second one goes nowhere. Curriculum without its articulation to students' everyday knowledge, sociocultural identities goes nowhere. 
but number one, uh, number two without number one is meaningless because instruction is pointless without a curricular object. It's the curriculum that is the school's reason for living. It's the curriculum that causes parents to send their kids to school. It's the stuff they're supposed to learn at school. A human rights education designed with both of these together, uh, whether for a single course or spiraled across the years of schooling would be an enormous achievement. So I kind of mean this to be, I, it's a terribly simple strategy, of course. I consider it a very basic answer to the question, what can we do to advance human rights education? What can we do to make it more robust? Of course, it needs a context, it needs an infrastructure. Um, you may have seen Audrey and Hughes editorial in the current issue of the journal where they're calling for an international research community, a more robust one. That's a very important infrastructure for getting this kind of work done. So here's two very basic statements about curriculum. Uh, first, if, if there is to be a human rights education in schools, there needs to be a human rights education curriculum. Uh, the curriculum is the knowledge, the subject matter, the what, what students have the opportunity to learn, should they have the opportunity to go to a good school and get good teachers. Uh, we Rightfully, we make a very big deal today of how important access to good schools and good teachers is and how very difficult that is to achieve. In the United States, there's tremendous inequality in education. It's really our largest educational problem. Um, I try to keep attention on a parallel matter, which is if kids were get, to get access to a good school and they're into good teachers, what would they learn there? That's the curriculum. I, that's where I'm trying to put my attention. So the second uh, statement there, like any curriculum, such as courses in biology or music or history or art or language, a human rights curriculum needs to be based on a theory of knowledge. So it, we're, we're drawn inexorably into epistemology. We can't avoid it when we do curriculum work. And a theory of knowledge is simply an idea of what is meant by knowledge. Further, any curriculum needs a theory about how to organize that knowledge for learning by children and youth of different stages and ages, of different cultures, different identities. Uh, and that, of course, includes, among other things, a framework for thinking about what it means to have a beginning, intermediate, and advanced understanding of the, a subject such as human rights education. What would we consider to be an a beginner's understanding of human rights education. How does that progress conceptually into an intermediate understanding? What would constitute an advanced understanding of human rights education? So again, I mean this to be a very basic uh, approach really to understanding the curricular work that's ahead of us. Let me get into a few details then here the uh, the knowledge that we expect to see at the core of the human rights curriculum are disciplinary concepts so now i'm getting into a theory of knowledge so concepts are ideas and disciplinary concepts would mean scientific or scholarly i don't know if it's true where you are uh around the world, but in the United States, the concept disciplinary knowledge rolls off the tongue very easily. It's the accepted term, if you will, for the kind of learning that gets done at school. Uh, but, but it's a funny term. I think we need to look at its meaning and, and its meaning is basically scientific or scholarly. And what that means is that these are ideas that are subject to ongoing criticism as, and revision as evidence demands. 
that's that's disciplinary knowledge. It's it's uh, it's factual. It's true until the evidence demands a revision. In epistemology, that's called fallibilism. It's the belief that knowledge is provisional. There are there is such a thing as facts. Uh, theories can be proven true or false. Once they're proven true, they remain true until evidence requires a revision. Uh, both the knowledge claims and the conditions of their production are available for examination. The work is public, in other words, publication. The specialist communities that produce such knowledge are more or less independent of religious dogma and political intimidation. So these, these cannot be assumed anymore. They, well, they never could be assumed. Uh, the scientific revolution broke uh, the scientists free of more or less the control of religious authorities back in the day were that's still an issue in many places and political intimidation can remain a issue just about everywhere. Uh, the relate, let me get back with that quote at the bottom from Vygotsky that when in the prior, uh, going back a couple of slides, the number two, the articulation of disciplinary knowledge with students' everyday knowledge. It's uh, Vygotsky, as well as Bernstein, who's taught us so much about how these two kinds of knowledge interact. And it's Vygotsky's uh, lesson that everyday concepts mediate the acquisition of scientific concepts or what he also called theoretic concepts. So they really need to be in tandem. Uh, students deserve, I wanted to just point out that in my view, students deserve disciplinary knowledge. Uh, it's different from everyday knowledge in that it's not experiential knowledge. That's why we have to go to school to learn it. Uh, whether it's history or biology just, or music theory, uh, a lot of that exists in our everyday lives, but the, the, the more specialized understandings, the intermediate and advanced understandings, if you will, of those subjects uh, require instruction. They are not as apparent in our everyday lives. They're not so context dependent. They tend to be context independent to a certain extent. Any idea by definition is abstract uh, and is exemplified in concrete experiential reality. So some details. Uh, if we had a robust human rights education, there would be a structure to it. Um, there would be concepts at its core, for example, there seems to be something of a consensus on core concepts in human rights education. Here's my own newcomer attempt to list some of them. Uh, in the current issue of the journal, Lee, Jerome, and colleagues have a really wonderful piece on the first concept, their rights. Just what in the world does that mean? And when they, in their study, they look at what kids mean by rights when they're talking about rights, they do talk about rights, but what are they meaning by rights? What's the concept? Rights is actually a quite a difficult concept. There's a whole field of epistemology and philosophy that deals with rights. It's called liberalism. Liberaliz liberalism is the philosophy of, of rights. Uh, and also in the same issue of the journal, there's an editorial by Audrey and her colleagues, the other editors, where they name the next two concepts, human dignity and equality as, th those are the only two concepts they, need, they mean, they name. So when I see something like that, I think to myself, ah, so they're naming just those two concepts. So those two concepts become contenders or candidates for the core of a human rights education. I talked with them last night at dinner with my wife and, uh, we, we spent pretty much the entire dinner hour just trying to poke around at the meaning of human dignity and human equality. 
uh, there are others, peaceful coexistence, respect. Respect is a very difficult concept. Audrey and I have had arguments about whether toleration belongs in this list or if toleration doesn't go far enough uh, and should be replaced by respect. Uh, my colleague here at the University of Washington, Jim Banks, often says to me, Walter, I don't want to be tolerated. I want to be respected. And I think that I, as a white male, can pretty much guarantee that I'm going to be tolerated in most situations as part of that privileged knapsack. But I also recognize that around the world, I, I believe there's probably millions of people who would, who would, uh, be, who would welcome would welcome toleration, uh, let alone respect. So to me, you know, I keep fighting for toleration to appear in lists of this sort, but I I keep losing those arguments, and and I understand justice, dissent, activism, struggle. Audrey emphasizes struggle in her book, Human Rights and Schooling. Then, of course, any, but the point there is that any robust curriculum has core concepts, and the people who have ab advanced knowledge of that subject typically can name what those concepts are, and usually they're arguing over what the small set of concepts sh should be. Um, as well, they're arguing over what a, the small set of texts are that represent best that subject area. In human rights education, of course, we have the Universal Declaration of Human Rights and the Convention on the Rights of the Child, and I'm sure there's more. I notice that Audrey emphasizes those two in her book, Human Rights and Schooling, and taking a lead from her, I began emphasizing those two in my own college teaching as well. I even use some of her activities that are in that book. Then core skills and dispositions what are they? In any course, we have to know what they are. There have to be just a handful. If there's too many, we can't teach them. They just all get mentioned. Nothing actually gets taught. Um, I noticed that Audrey and Hugh and their colleagues in the editorial in the current issue name a disposition in addition to the two concepts that they name. The disposition they name, they name is the the responsibility we have to protect and advocate human rights for others in addition to ourselves. So I, I pay attention to that when I see something like that. I, I'm imagining that that sort of rob, obligation, if you will, that responsibility to be an upstander, to take responsibility for the protection of human rights of others is at the core of human rights education. I would imagine because all education, like all politics is local, there are iconic local stories that might be at the core of a human rights education curriculum that makes particular sense locally, whether that's nationally or within the nation. In the United States, for example, the civil rights struggle is a huge part of our human rights education in the nation. It's also one reason that we don't really have what many of you around the world, I think, would rec recognize as a human rights curriculum in American schools. We don't read the, human, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights or the Convention of the Rights of the Child. They are not in any way common in K-12 education in the United States. Instead, there's that space is fairly well occupied by the civil rights tradition in the United States, where the core texts are range from the Bill of Rights to our Constitution to Martin Luther King Jr.'s famous letter from Birmingham jail and many other documents uh, in between, such as the Sec Seneca Falls Declaration of the Human of the Rights of Women. So what I'm trying to do there is just sort of suggest what a structure of a curriculum would look like. So um, I might just say a little something about the challenge of finding a structure, and then I'll I'll stop. Uh, the 
I spend a lot of time, I do currently spend a lot of time working on high school social studies courses, trying to redesign them so that they have a clearer core, a, a small set of core concepts, for example, a small set of core texts, a small set of core skills and dispositions that are taught in depth. And this is a really interesting and difficult problem. It's not anything that any of us should try to do alone because it, it's, it's, we require an argument over what that small set of core subject matter might look like. There are some old metaphors for this. When I was going through teacher education program in the late or in the early 70s in Colorado, where I was born and raised in Denver at the University of Colorado, we talked about branches and trunks that the core concepts would be the more like the trunks. Of course, they have branches. That's sort of where the problem is that we feel that we can't teach only the trunk. We need to teach the branches. We need to elaborate on the trunk by getting into the branches. Another popular metaphor is posts to wire in fences. So what are the fence posts of the curriculum? And then we string wire between the posts. Another popular one is a solar metaphor, suns to planets. This is one I've been using more recently uh, here in a high school government course. To, if you, uh, in the United States, the key concept, the most core concept for understanding US government, here it is. This is my little factoid for you, the big takeaway to figure out what the heck is going on in the United States today is to understand that the core concept is federalism, which basically is that sharing of power between the national government and the 50 state governments. Uh, federalism is the idea that in any one place you have at least two political authorities over you. Well, there's a lot of uh, surrounding planets and moons that are necessary to understand that concept. And here I named just three of them, states' rights, shared power, and the supremacy clause in the US Constitution, which states that the federal, the national government is supreme. But there's so many court cases fought over when the national government should be allowed to make a policy that covers all 50 states, and when the 50 states should be allowed to make their own rules and regulations. That affects everything from marriage, whether or not same-sex marriage is allowed in your state. Now it is because it's required by the federal government to marijuana legislation. So I live in a state where marijuana is legal, but I live in a country where it's illegal. That's hard to figure out, isn't it? That's federalism in a nutshell. So let me end with that and just kind of reiterate that my desire is for human rights education to have a large footprint in the schools. It doesn't currently, at least not in the United States, perhaps it does where you are. And to the extent that it has a large footprint, it has a structure, it has a core that's been developed around which there is some agreement that's what I'm after. Audrey, I turn it back to your good hands. And you are muted. Thank you very much, Walter. Um, as, as you're talking, I'm, I'm rethinking your paper and I'm rethinking um, how I'm understanding it uh, afresh. And um, we welcome questions and, and comments uh, from the audience while uh, people are thinking about what they would care to ask. Um, I'd like to ask one about the core concepts and the places that we come from uh, in determining those core concepts. So when I look at the question of struggle, for example, if that is a core concept, I don't read that in the documents 
I read that from life experiences. And you began by talking about uh, your life experiences as an um, older white male in the United States. And they, that might be a very different starting point from uh, uh, any, any other uh, US citizen that we might choose to name or any other demographic. So when we're selecting, when we're identifying those core concepts, um, the question becomes whose knowledge is this and whose, whose curriculum is this? And I wonder if you could just reflect on that, that question mm -hmm. a little bit, given that struggle wouldn't be a concept I would find in the documents, it would be, a, 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 as an example, it would be a concept that I would uh, pull out from, from life experience. Right. Uh Thank you. I mean, I think that is the question of the day. I uh, reminds I very much appreciate an article that was appeared in the journal already that is a response to my article by a professor Sen in Turkey and uh, encourage you all to read that. I really appreciated the criticism. Uh, and he raises a somewhat similar question though perhaps not specific to the concept struggle. By the way, Audrey, is struggle not called out in say the declaration or the convention of the rights of child? I, I don't read it that way. Uh-huh. But I think your, your question gets to the relationship between these two steps, the identification of the core concepts and skills, and then the articulation with of them with students' everyday knowledge and identities. And that's somewhat this uh, point that Professor Sen res raises as well. There is no way to avoid that tension. It's part, it goes with the territory of school teaching and of curriculum development. So, so it seemed to me that if, if struggle, and you articulate this in your book, if struggle is a core concept, and it arises, it's, it's a concept that lives in our experience. Uh, it, it strikes me that it can rise then and must rise to a place in the curriculum where local and both individual and group struggles become part of the curriculum. Uh, the, it's, and then I can't imagine for the moment, maybe it's because I lack a good imagination, but I can't imagine what the opposition would be to struggle being part of the core curriculum. I can only think of political ones. <laughs> uh, yeah, we've got two questions from um, some of the um, colleagues that you have named in your uh, talk. And the first question comes from Lee Jerome. Um, I'll ask Lee to switch his camera on so you can see him, but I will ask the question, uh, to what extent do you think we should be pursuing Young's powerful knowledge or should we just have a more general conversation about knowledge? <laughs> That's great. Thank you, Professor Jerome. If I haven't met you, I'm eager to meet you one day and I hope we can be in touch. The uh, I appreciated your article very much. Well, I, I believe that Young is, uh, Michael Young is doing some of the best work on understanding why disciplinary knowledge is the knowledge that we should be focusing on at school. And uh, so that's where I find the stimulation in his work. It helps me personally think through the tension between uh, scientific knowledge, if you will, and everyday experience or everyday knowledge and how the two can be and need to be articulated at school and why school needs to be focused primarily on disciplinary knowledge since that knowledge cannot be learned or, or is difficult to learn at home and in the neighborhood. Um, it, it's the disciplinary knowledge that is mind expanding because it takes us out away from the boxes of our upbringing. Uh, parents often are, uh, when, when cases go to, when 
curriculum cases at school go to court when they, as we say in the United States, they go before a judge or a jury because there's a conflict over what's being taught at school. Just think of the conflicts over climate change curriculum or the conflicts over teaching evolution at school or the conflicts over teaching multicultural education at school. You must be familiar with these conflicts wherever you live. We certainly are. Uh, parents often do not want the school curriculum to take their children very far away from the values and beliefs of the home, as you know. Those three examples I just gave are good ones. That's because disciplinary knowledge often does take us away from the everyday experience and values of the home and hearth. And that gives us a little insight into why disciplinary knowledge is sort of by definition somewhat dangerous and somewhat controversial or can be. Um, so I, I think there's a lot of value to, in summary, Professor Jerome, to uh, the particular angle on powerful knowledge that uh, Michael Young and his uh, colleagues have developed. And I have myself learned a great deal from that. Uh, it's similar to the sort of work we learned from Vygotsky. They take it, their legacy is through Basil Bernstein, however. I appreciate that. Okay, uh, we have a question um, from Sue Golifer, and I'm going to ask Sue, who's in Iceland, if she'd like to put the question directly to you, Walter, if, she, if we can hear her. You can. Thank you. Um, hi, Audrey. Uh, thank you very much, Walter. Um, I really enjoyed your article uh, and I very much appreciated having the opportunity to come and listen to you um, explain it. So my question is really about you're talking about curriculum development in terms of, you know, knowledge, skills, dispositions as a collaborative approach. Um, but I'm wondering and I'm thinking about the Icelandic context where human rights forms one of the core curricular themes in the national curriculum guides, but the reality is in a school context, and I'm sp uh, speaking specifically about upper secondary school, it's on the periphery of the curriculum and it's become accepted, almost accepted that that's okay because we have a very dominant um, uh, subject-based curriculum. So I, I suppose I'm wondering, what precedes this idea of building a robust curriculum? What needs to be addressed in order to get to that stage? Thank you, Susan. Great question, sort of a $64,000 question. So there it sounds like you, that it might be somewhat analogous to the case in the United States where what we call multicultural education is accepted, it's sort of everywhere, but kind of nowhere. It's on the periphery, it's on the cafeteria wall, the slogans celebrate diversity, uh, yet it's not, it's not one of the courses in the middle school or the high school. It's, uh, so I think, if I understand what you're asking about is how, how do we move a curriculum that is present, but peripheral and marginalized more into the core, such as biology or algebra are, is that more or less the question? I'm muted. Yes, it is. And I think it's actually Jing Williams question that follows mine is probably getting to the point when um, uh, the question is about a training program, you know, how do we work with teachers initially, because you get resistance from teachers when you have a very strong subject based curriculum, there is resistance amongst teachers. Mm -hmm. Of course, the, uh, we should probably turn it over to that next questioner then just to get her view okay. on that. Let me just add, though, that the You're, you're, you're identifying the problem uh, if, if uh, for example, if, if, te if teachers themselves are not wanting to move the periphery to the core, then there are reasons for that. 
the and there are good reasons for that that must be explored. It could be that priorities are being set and uh, the conversation that needs to occur is about the priorities then uh, and why they're being set in that particular way. STEM, of course, probably around the world is being prioritized over the liberal arts and the social sciences today. And both of them are being prioritized over human rights education and multicultural education. And we all need to be asking what's up with that. But let's, uh, do you, would you like, uh, Audrey, I'll let you take. Yeah, I'm, I'm not gonna take Jing's question right now. I'm going to take a question um, uh, from uh, a colleague from the Netherlands, Ina, who's asking about disciplinary knowledge. Yeah, Are can I come in, can I come in for a moment? Please, please. Um, well, you were, uh, thank you very much for your presentation. I really enjoy it very much. You were talking about the difference between the uh, values from home and the human rights values at school, that there is a kind of tension between those values. And on the one hand, I think we should move into the direction of the children and the learners and use their experiences and their language. And on the other hand, we have to um, almost force them into the direction of human rights values. Um, I think then human rights education function as a kind of disruptive moment, stimulating the development of the learners. I would like to know your opinion on that. Just would repeat your last sentence, would you? It's what you believe you said. Well, I, I think it might be so that um, human rights education functions as a disruptive moment and as such stimulates the development of the learners um, uh, in the direction of a human rights culture. Mm -hmm. So with the slide that I currently have on and sharing on the screen, that sounds to me like you're articulating number one and number two, and that the human rights curriculum let's let that be number one, functions, it, it interacts in a way with the everyday knowledge and identity of students in a particular way that you're calling disruptive and that you regard as a productive disruption. Yeah, sure. You know, yeah. You know, I think that's a nice frame for how one and two interact. You may know to take a different, a, very different example, uh, a science educator named Vosnadu has done some, I think 20 years ago or so, a series of studies on how uh, in our everyday experience for children in particular, but my everyday experience for all of us, the sun does appear to rise in the east and set in the west. And she did an intriguing set of interviews with kids about that. Uh, trying to get at the to get the disciplinary knowledge of the solar system that we know the the copernican universe to disrupt the belief and the experience that the child has that the sun is actually rising in the east and it, similarly our experience is that the earth is flat we don't experience the roundness of the earth so I think the articulation of scientific knowledge with everyday knowledge is very juicy and can be mobilized in the interest of human rights education, precisely as you're suggesting. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Well, we have a different kind of question um, coming. I think it's a different kind of question from Cornelia uh, Rue in South Africa. Cornelia, are you there? Doesn't look as though she's there. She's she's saying, struggle my Can you hear me? <laughs> oh great, you are there. Great. Please. <laughs> that, it's nice to meet you. Uh, you've nice always to meet you rather than in her face. That's one of the reasons I asked for your question to see you. Please, please go ahead with your question. 
Um, thank you, Aubrey. Um, um, I just want to actually first make a comment and that is that I think struggle might not be politically only because in our environment, it's much more also related to material realities in place, space and time, which brings a much different core to what a curriculum should, could of what it should have. Not that I say that value skills and actions aren't important and I think it's important, but in our research, what we found in many issues, especially in teacher training, is that, um, and so not only in South Africa, but also in different developing and developed countries, especially in post-colonial environments and colonial, pre-colonial environments, is that the nexus between what is known from human rights, declarations and issues and so on, and what the education brings to the fore, either in curriculum or in what, they, there's a sort of a, a dis, disconnected environment. And um, therefore my question to you is, um, we working, my question is actually human rights literacies is actually for me and for us, the nexus before you can actually start with the instruction or knowledge and skills. Um, it's not only about stories of people or what, but there's a, there's, there are layers, intersectionalities of, if I may say, for a person from a specific race group of um, in, um, edu economical environment or what, it might change or be so different from what the teacher or the curriculum development had in mind. So my question is actually, whose knowledge? What knowledge? Whose skills, whose actions would like to take that? Because in a multicultural environment, multi-layered environment that we work, we found that the literacy, and that's not only the knowledge, it's a much more complex environment, needs actually to be the nexus. And my question to you is just who's, who's going to decide on the display of knowledge in the curriculum in the sense that if you want to have it either federal or provincial or state or school or whatever. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Audrey. Mm -hmm. Well, that is the, thanks so much, Cornelia. That is the, another of the $64,000 questions. Again, I think you're articulating the relationship between number one and two on this slide as Ina was, but in a, in a slightly different way. The, uh, maybe I could make two comments there. Uh, the, the everyday knowledge of the child is unavoidable in education, or actually the problem is that we do avoid it too often. Uh, and must not avoid it. We must uh, respond to the funds of knowledge, the literacies that uh, children bring from the material conditions of their lives into the school. The, so what then should be the school curriculum? There's, there's the question, there's the rub. What should be the school curriculum? The answer to that question that uh, comes out of the critical sociology literature of Basil Bernstein, Lev Vygotsky, Michael Young, uh, in South Africa, Hoadley, uh, Johann Mueller, uh, is that the whose knowledge question for the school curriculum is the knowledge that comes from the scientific community, knowledge of the world that has been argued and vetted and is evidence-based and has grown up through a process of conceptual progression to be the best understanding we collectively have of the world today that it, it, that is evidence-based, so that leaves faith communities to the side. Uh, you could make an argument that instead the knowledge taught in school 
is the everyday knowledge of students. But it does seem to me that that would be a difficult argument to make on several fronts. Though I think that this is exactly where progressive educators now, that would be a term we would use in the United States. I'm not quite sure what term would relate to wherever you may be. Leftist educators perhaps um, seem to be really stymied right now by the whose knowledge question. And it is part of the reason that since about the 1960s, the progressive educators have stopped produ have stopped not entirely, I don't mean that at all, I don't mean to exaggerate, but uh, progressive educators have, have to a great extent stopped producing curriculum because they're stymied by the whose knowledge question. Uh, and I think it's important that we make progress through that uh, sort of stagnation so that we can do curriculum work for the schools as opposed to uh, not doing curriculum work for the schools. And I think that's the risk we take when we become confused by the who, whose knowledge question. I'm afraid that is a terribly unsatisfactory response to your question. Do you want to talk back to me a little about that, Cornelia? If I may, um, I'm just always weary of a, bot of, of a top down issue when it comes to human rights curriculum. Um, it, it is um, from my side or my side of the world, it can be very westernized in an environment where indigenous knowledges of human rights is also more and can be linked to, a, as in your case, Bill of Rights from the Americans, but we use also a Bill of Rights and, and some issues. I don't say that shouldn't be there. I just say that a bottom up understanding of what human rights can be, should be, helps to flow into the nexus between the human right and the education. And if that nexus can be sort of formulated or understand or have uh, incorporated more things than a disciplinary understanding, we have science correctly, but they are also very much indigenous knowledges, which is not something that you can say, okay, I set that aside. It's part of this nexus material realities of place, space and time, which, which brings to the fore into the curriculum a, a, a much more open understanding than the structured environment. And I see your one and two comes to fore, but when the action and the knowledge doesn't link to one another, the value can be, can be you can lose the value. You can oversee the value of what it actually yeah. means if yeah. you have those three together. But I think I've said enough. Thank you, Audrey, for the time and Walter for your response. You. Appreciate Thank you. I'm very aware of the time and I'm also very aware that uh, we have just got like one minute to close now. And I just want to tell you, Walter, that Karim Sen had a question about Dewey, but maybe he can put, it's a big one, I think, and maybe he can put that to you directly and then you're in contact with somebody who's built on your work. And Thank you. we had a very yeah. interesting observation yeah. um, from Laura Lundy, um, uh, saying that um, she wondered whether the US's lack of in engagement with the UN human rights system and the suggestion this may have something to do with the focus on civil rights was much more to do with a distrust dismissal of an external accountability framework or a symptom of American exceptionalism. And I'm going to uh -huh. end with uh, Laura's uh, comment here because Laura is actually one of our speakers for our next session. So I would um, just remind everybody uh, that we do have a session coming up in April and that you can sign up for that session and we'd love to see you there. I'd like to thank Walter very warmly for speaking today and for 
provoking so many different questions. And I, I hope that uh, we don't lose this chat line um, when the session is over and that we can somehow save that and, and, and think about some of these issues that are coming up. I'd like to thank Walter for participating and I'd like to thank all of you for coming along and helping make this um, webinar series work. This is number three and each time we've gathered many, many new people, um, many, many new ideas. Um, if you're interested, Walter, Hugh has got lots of extra concepts he thinks you should add to your list. <laughs> there are many, many things going on in this chat line that I can't pull together now. But thank you, everybody, for participating. I hope, Walter, you have a great day today because we're, we're winding down now and you're yeah. getting going with your work yeah. for the day. Thank you for giving your time to us. And thank you, everybody across the globe. We've got people in Latin America all over the place that, that, that haven't had a, a chance to speak. A man from Bangladesh who didn't want to share his question via me, but wanted to ask it directly. I'm sorry that you haven't all had a chance to speak, but thank you for participating. Yeah, no problem. And listening. Yeah, no problem. Oh, thank, you. Now. thank you very much, yeah. Walter. And goodbye, everyone. Yeah. Thank you.